Uh, this is more like uh, the story of the last uh, 15 years of collaboration between uh, me, the people in Vienna and the people in Padua, meaning Helmut Kern, Hugo Carraro and Sandra Zampieri mostly. And uh, but before I do that, I wanna go back a little and talk about the, those years in which this collaboration started. And to do this, I will show you this cartoon taken from a book and I'm sorry for uh, it's in Italian, but uh, when I look cartoons of skeletal muscle fibers, in books, what I notice is that uh, even in books, uh, they, the, the ultrastructure of the muscle fiber is presented in a very, very ordered fashion. No? You see here the myofibrils, which are very well aligned with one another transversally. And also the sarcotubular system is very ordered, you know, with two transvertubule for each sarcomere. But one thing that is never corrected in the, in the textbooks is the way they put mitochondria in the muscle fibers. Because here you see this um, brown potatoes in the fibers that are put on all this ordered way. And this is, I will show you soon, and this is not really the way mitochondria are disposed in muscle. But why we got interested in to study the disposition of mitochondria in skeletal muscle fibers? And Padua is back in the story because it was 2004 and I, was ju I ju just came back from the United States, it was 2002. After I spent there about uh, almost 10 years, first working with Clara Armstrong at the University of Pennsylvania, and then with Paul Allen uh, at Harvard Medical School. But when I came back to Italy, I was starting to look around for collaborations and ideas to, to develop the, the different lines of uh, projects in my lab. And there was this very interesting paper coming out from uh, the uh, the laboratory of uh, Rosario Rizzuto. And this paper of Rudolf showed that mitochondria during skeletal muscle contraction, they take up calcium very fast between uh, one stimulation and the other. And, uh, and this was very interesting to us because um, nobody was expecting this kind of result. This was a paper published in uh, Journal of Cell Biology. So we started to think about this issue. You're gonna see this cartoon several times these days, but during EC coupling, calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum via the Ryan of the receptors. And then uh, uh, to allow uh, skeletal muscle relaxation, so the calcium is taken away from the cytoplasm, but a little amount of calcium enters the mitochondria. And this is important to stimulate the aerobic ATP production by these organelles. But in all this, there is a paradox. So if we take mitochondria out of muscle and we try to expose them to calcium, you need a very high concentration of calcium to get calcium to get in, this, uh, in these organelles. About, I think, 30 micromolar. And this is not the concentration that is reached by, by calcium during, the, during EC coupling. So, and this is kind of a difficult issue to explain. No? And uh, so the physiologists came up with this idea that uh, what we measure as calcium concentration in muscle fiber, what it is, is the global calcium concentration. But it is possible that in, inside the fibers, so there may be some little micro domains, maybe between uh, two membranes in which the concentration of calcium rises very high. And then this would explain how mitochondria can take up calcium through the mitochondria calcium uniporter. This protein that again has been discovered by a group in Padua and also by a group at Harvard Medical School. But uh, together they came out with this uh, molecular identity of the mitochondrial calcium reporter and it was uh, 2011. And uh, so we started to study this and it was uh, around 2005, 2006 and with uh, uh, people in the lab at the time and Simona was already there. And these are again, uh, pictures by Simona. So we found that if you look uh, at fast twitch fibers and you, what I pointed here is uh, these are the triads, the calcium release sites. The mitochondria are just located next to them, always in the same position. Um, so mitochondria are next to the calcium release unit associated to them, always on the side toward the Z line. If you look at, at the triad here, again, the mitochondria is next to it, close to the Z line. So all, most mitochondria are at the I band in fast twitch fibers. In slow twitch fibers, you have this population of mitochondria, and then there are some longitudinal columns between myofibrils. And then 
under the sarcolemma, some groups of mitochondria next to the, to the um, capillaries. So if you look at this image, in, in, an enlargement of the interaction between uh, one triad, the release site. So the release site is this point here in which uh, um, calcium has to be released. The distance with, with the mitochondria is about 130 to 160 nanometers. And this probably could, could be the structural base for the formation of these microdomains. So meaning that maybe in this position, mitochondria are close enough to feel the release of calcium and get a being uh, flooded by a high concentration of calcium. So in doing this, uh, um, 2009, we published this paper in which we were able also to publish this, uh, I think beautiful, um, not sure why I'm not getting the animation of this. It was supposed to work, but this beautiful 3D reconstruction in which you see one triad here in, uh, in, in cyan, you see the Ryan of the receptor, white, the transfer tube or DSR, and the mitochondria is uh, linked to the triad by these little strands that here are represented in red. And at the time we named in the paper tethers because uh, already in non-muscle cells, similar structure were named tethers. We are not sure about the molecular identity of this uh, little strand yet. However, we try to get some indirect uh, indication of what could be the possible role of tethers in skeletal muscle. And if you see this, so this is a little movie of about 20 minutes, and it's a good thing that this one is working, of mitochondria stained in green uh, in, uh, with mitotracker green in non-muscle cells. And you see the mitochondria make this network which is pretty mobile. And now we know from the work of many groups, uh, the mitochondria, they undergo fusion and fission. And so it's a pretty dynamic, dynamic network. But then uh, is this true also in skeletal, in muscle fibers, skeletal muscle fibers? And the same length of movie, 20 minutes, mitochondria in green, but mitochondria in skeletal muscle fibers, they're not going anywhere. So they're pretty stuck there. And this doesn't mean that they won't move in longer time, but Again, the mobility of mitochondria and skeletal muscle fiber is not as the one in other, in other type of cells. And so the, we suggested that tethers are important for holding mitochondria in a specific sub, subcellular position. And if they are, the mitochondria needs to be held there, maybe is because this position next to calcium release unit is very important for mitochondrial function and also for skeletal muscle function. So we started to develop this idea that not only the number, not only the volume of mitochondria, but in skeletal muscle, the position of mitochondria is important for function. And we started to collect uh, information in parallel projects. And this was already 2009 when we published this, but the collaboration with Hugo Carraro, which came to uh, Chieti Hugo in 2003, if you remember the first time we met, you came there and I uh, was still young and um, actually very tall, blue eyes. Uh, um, and uh, you proposed to me to start working in collaboration with Helmut. And we started to work in denervation, right? And we did our first travel to Vienna. And I met there Helmut, I think it was uh, again 2003 or 2004 at the most. And we started to working in denervation. And uh, in denervation, we know this one thing, you know? We noticed that uh, when you denervate the muscle, and this is a, a rabbit uh, muscle denervated for 10 weeks, and here comes in the collaboration with Stanley Salmon that I, and Jonathan Jarvis that I don't know they are online right now. But when you denervate muscle, all of a sudden, very quickly, the mitochondria loses the position I showed you, and they become, they go into longitudinal columns like this. And I, I didn't show you the control, but in the control, uh, what you have, you have the very similar situation to the one I asked you in the previous uh, image. And also the, this is a transversal thing. Also in rats, this was a collaboration with Fabio Francini. And uh, you see again, the mitochondria, when you denervate the fiber, they make this longitudinal column and they lose the proper association with calcium release units. And uh, this is also true in humans. Sorry that I'm not showing uh, images in humans, but here it comes in the collaboration with uh, with the group of uh, Helmut Kern, which was using functional electrical stimulation in denervated subjects. And this is a vastus lateralis of uh, um, 
a patient that was denervated for 14 years and then uh, elect electrical stimulation for about five years. And now, believe me if I tell you that the, the innervated muscle, the structural uh, um, architecture is, is destroyed, but after stimulating the muscle long enough and activating muscle contraction, what you get is that uh, you get back your uh, beautiful triads that you see here pointed and the mitochondria again next to them. So, and this is kind of, this is an idea that we developed for a long time. This may, may be important with, uh, in this collaboration, uh, did we use functional electrical stimulation only to stimulate denervated muscle? No, with Helmut uh, and uh, Hugo and uh, Sandra and all the other people that, sorry, I'm forgetting to mention somebody. Um, we try to use this uh, functional electrical stimulation also in other, uh, situation very recent is this publication in 2019 in which we use functional electrical stimulation for the treatment of a patient affected by central core disease and central core disease uh, uh, is a disease uh, caused by um, loss of mitochondria in the central areas of the fiber the central cores are central areas of the fiber that are missing the uh, mitochondrial staining. The mitochondria gets damaged and they probably disappear from the fibers. But this is a disease caused by mutation in Ryan of the receptor type 1. A, the calcium release channel of skeletal muscle, which is located in triads. So the triads have mutation in, uh, in the Ryan of the receptor. Some of these mutations are leaky and maybe the mitochondria get sick and they disappear from the fiber. So we were interested in central core disease because uh, we were interested in, uh, in calcium release from triads. So uh, we, we treated this patient uh, and I was supposed to give this presentation this afternoon, but uh, I won't give this presentation, but we use uh, functional electrical stimulation for 26 months in a patient of, a, it was a female of 50, 55 years of age. And we got some results and this paper is published and we've got increased muscle mass and improved muscle structure in the fibers and in increased force, isometric force. And uh, in the, the also we measure some, uh, the balance of the patient while standing in open eye position and closed eye position. And we got some uh, positive indication, but this was only one case report. So uh, obviously this, uh, the, the use of functional electrical stimulation has to be validated in this case. But this paper, Yodisha is the first name, is published in 2019 in Frontier, Frontiers in Neurology. And um, again, obviously, this uh, was a collaboration with the group in Vienna that provided us with the stimulator and with the protocols to apply to this, uh, to this patient. And what about aging? Well, yes, we did use functional electrical stimulation also in aging. And this paper that was published um, um, I think it was 2014, first name Elmus Kern, but if you read all the names down here, you may recognize some of the main actors in all of this uh, long uh, time collaboration. Also, I all forget to mention Winfried that uh, provided the stimulators and the people in Bratislava, Marco Sandri, Sandra Zampieri, Antonio Musaro, and uh, all of us. And the results of this uh, paper showed that uh, electrical stimulation counteracted in an effective way muscle decline in seniors and that could be invalidated and somehow the, the use of FES for the, as a, an effective and safe method to counteract the loss of muscle function and to improve muscle force in aging. And uh, um, I wanted to conclude with this slide, but I don't wanna uh, take away the work uh, of uh, Laura. This, this uh, project will be presented this afternoon in a talk of 20 minutes by Laura uh, Pietrangelo. But what we did uh, together again with the people in Vienna and, uh, and in Padova, we developed the different lines, you know, in which uh, first we analyzed biopsies from you know, human vastus lateralis for young adults, senior sedentary people and senior sportsmen that uh, were practicing uh, different sports for at least uh, half of their life. And then uh, parallel studies here. We studied mice, uh, control mice, uh, adult, and then uh, aging mice of uh, 25 months of age, and then exercise mice, mice that ran 
in real cages for one year and in the second uh, part of their life. And also we studied uh, EDL uh, from rats, adults in this, case, in this case, which we denervated and we allowed re-innervation. And what we were uh, trying to, uh, to demonstrate the scientific hypothesis of this project that again will be presented this afternoon in a full talk is that the correct association between calcium release unit and mitochondria, uh, we think is challenged by aging and mostly by inactivity can be maintained and improved by muscle activity exercise, both in the adults and uh, in aging. And uh, to show very briefly what we think is that the organization of sarcoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria, which is very uh, well uh, organized in muscle, there is this uh, specific association between uh, the, the myofibrils, the sarcomere, and the position of triads and mitochondria is lost very quickly when we inactivate muscle by uh, simply by being sedentary or by denervation or by bed resting. But the one good thing is that we found is that this is reversible. So if we stimulate denervated muscle with FAST, we can reorganize this structure. If we start, uh, the, if we exercise the mice on in, in uh, sedentary people that, that practice exercise for their life, this structure is very well maintained, and we think that this is very important for the efficiency of, my, efficiency of muscle in producing ATP. So the mitochondria needs to be next to calcium release unit to read properly calcium release during easy coupling and produce in an effective way, an effective way ATP. And I wanted to finish by thanking most my collaborators. Uh, again, this presentation is pointed to to the collaboration with Vienna and Padova, but there are other important people in this project. And uh, I, wanna, I, don't wanna man, I don't wanna forget of Marco, of Antoni Musaro, Marco Sandri and all the people in Bratislava, everybody. Thank you very much for this uh, experience because it has been an experience. Uh, 15, maybe more years of collaboration with you has been a pleasure for me. And uh, thank you for all the people present at this presentation also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Feliciano. Thank you for your very impressive and education uh, uh, talk. I think it's clear what you are uh, telling us. And is there any question from the audience? Yes, I have a question. Please. Andrew. First, compliments for this theory about the, you know, the action of this uh, calcium entry units and the interaction with mitochondria. It seems to me that you are Be more precise. These are the calcium release units. Um, calcium release units. Yes. I mean, there is a lot of, uh, I mean, interaction between inactivity, calcium release units, and their muscular junction. We have heard yesterday from uh, the physiologist. So I want to know, is your whole thing related to activity? And the second point is that you have treated a patient with central core. This is a weak patient. Are you, not, are you sure that too much activity is not bad for such a patient? Uh, I start with the second question, but only because I didn't understand the first one. But then you're going to ask me again. Uh, about the central core disease, these are, uh, yes, weak patients. Obviously, central core disease is going to... Um, it, there is a lot of muscle weakness. And since we, we got this idea, because since we used uh, functional electrical stimulation also to improve a little bit the force of weak muscles of aging people, yeah. thought we could apply it also to this patient. And we got some results, some increase in muscle mass and uh, some uh, better capability of the patient because for the standing, you know, we got some positive, uh, uh, positive results. So I think, uh, functional electrical stimulation only for about uh, half an hour to an hour a day, it could be not a problem for this patient. Yeah. Um, our data indicates that there is some improvement, both functional and structural. So this is my impression, but obviously I leave this in the hands of neurologists that have to tell me if this, uh, when they apply this, if they decide somebody to apply this uh, technique to more patient, then it's going to- I have used it in myotonic dystrophy. What? We used it in myotonic dystrophy patients with good results and published on that. 
Okay. Well, uh, see, you know, all, what I think usually is that uh, inactivity is never good. And okay. so activity is always good for all patients.